You're listening to a podcast by the Center for Action and Contemplation. To learn more, visit cac.org. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel is written to us by Matthew. Now John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Turn around, the kingdom of God is already at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, There will be a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Now John wore clothing made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to hear him. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, where they acknowledged their sinfulness. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Not a very nice guy. Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the ax lies at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that does not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for a change of heart, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to even carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, we've got our work to do, as we usually do. Text without context always gets you in trouble. And um, this gospel, although I like it very much, it needs context. I wrote a book about 10 years ago called Falling Upward. And in many ways, uh, this gospel allows me to illustrate it in very short form. Let's take John the Baptist Uh, It's called the spirituality of the two halves of life. John the Baptist is the symbol of the first half of life, where you're, as you probably see in some of your teenagers, not all of them, you're overly zealous, you're overly concerned about being right and being perfect and being best and being biggest and being important and... uh, In the religion, it takes the form of what is called righteousness. You assert your righteousness over and against other people. A lot of people never get beyond the religion of John the Baptist. It's always accusing other people. It's always pointing out other people's faults. It moves forward by threats, as we end with here. Unquenchable fire. I don't know how that's supposed to make you fall in love with God, but uh, the zealot tries that. He thinks you can be pushed or shoved or forced into heaven, into transformation. If John the Baptist is an appropriate symbol of the first half of life, now remember, this is not chronological. Very often I've met very young people who because of suffering or because of extraordinary parents 
are already in their younger years in the so-called second half of life. And I've met old guys like me who are still babies. They haven't begun to grow up. So it's not chronological. It's where the soul is, how much you have learned from what you have loved and what you have suffered. So um, the second half of life is symbolized by Jesus and maybe the one line here that most gives it away, I baptize you merely with water. Pouring water over people, let's be honest, doesn't change them very much. I suppose you all had it done to you. I did too when I was eight days old. But it didn't change anything. It was just a ritual. All for it. I do it myself. But it doesn't change your mind. doesn't change your heart doesn't change your attitude toward reality or the world. He says the real baptism comes from Jesus, and he calls it the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. This is when you really get the point. Now hopefully that begins to happen somewhere in the middle of life. After you've loved a bit, suffered a bit, failed a bit, rejoiced a bit, lived a bit. Uh, you don't start there. No one starts there. We all start with the religion of John the Baptist. We try to show how zealous we are. Uh, it's all symbolized by asceticism, eating locusts. I don't know why that would make God happy necessarily. Have you ever tried it? <laughs> I've eaten grasshoppers. Uh, they serve them at fancy cafes in Santa Fe. Fried grasshoppers. Chip chipulinas? Is that it? Chapulinas? Yeah, chapulinas. And they're not very good, really. <laughs> but now they're gourmet food, you know. So maybe John the Baptist was ahead of his time. But you see how judgmental he is, how harsh he is. You brood of vipers, who warned you? It's almost as if he doesn't want them to be converted. Produce good fruit. That's why I said, you know, I, I don't know that most of us would like John the Baptist, but yet we call him a prophet, we call him a saint, and that's good, but he's a saint for the first half of life. If you're not zealous and excited about something, something, when you're a kid, you probably won't be excited about anything in the second half of life. Maybe it's just being in the starting five of the basketball team. Maybe it's being the prettiest girl at the dance, or the, most, the best dancer, or driving the biggest car. It, it's pretty stupid, but when you're young, that's what you worry about. You know, that's what you think success is. Being the best and the brightest and the richest, we, I call it in the book, building your container, or a psychologist would call it building your ego structure, your house. Saying to the world, I am important. I matter. You're all, your kids all got to do that. They got to. You sort of want to smile and look the other way because you know it doesn't mean very much by the time you're 40, but they've got to do it. They've got to do it. And don't take it away from them. But that very house, that very identity, let's call it that, that you've built in the first half of life that is very zealous and righteous and convicted and opinionated. That's why kids are hard to raise. They're so opinionated about things that don't really matter. They don't know that yet. <laughs> but you're supposed to know that yet. Now when you don't know, we're really in trouble, you see. So they, but you got to let them go through it. You got to just smile and look the other way and affirm their necessary 
successes, their necessary triumphs. I'm sure my parents did the same to me when I zealously left Kansas and went off to Ohio to become a Franciscan. Oh, great. Uh, well, it ended up being rather nice, but uh, it starts by being overly concerned about your own superiority, your own specialness, your own smartness, whatever, pick any of those good words. Then the very house that you built, here's the bad news, sorry, has to fall apart to grow up. The axe is set to the root of the tree. Oh, darn it. You thought you were the best, the best country, the best religion, the best political party, the best gender. Uh, pick it. It doesn't matter. But it's always the best. And it's always you. And that has to fall apart. Do you hear me? It has to fall apart because it isn't true. It's all about you. It's not about life or love or God. If the first half of life is about zeal and ambition, the second half of life is basically about compassion. It's a whole different agenda. You're not concerned about being numero uno. You're not concerned about your country being best, as some of our leaders in Washington want to tell us. That's an utter lie. It's a terrible lie, and every spiritual teacher would tell you so. It's never going to create peace on earth. It's never going to create love. It's never going to create compassion. But when the whole country is led by teenagers, at least in their mind, that's the best we can do. Now you come here to be led into the second half of life, to be led to wisdom instead of just knowledge, understanding instead of just information. That's the second half of life. That's the religion of Jesus. I don't know how many Christians get there. Some get there on their deathbed Really, they do. It's amazing how many do in the last five days of life. They finally wake up and realize what really matters and all the things that didn't matter at all. So in my book, the first third of the book is trying to describe what's good and what's bad about the first half of life. The middle of the book is stumbling over the stumbling stone, falling, failing, making mistakes, sinning, if you will. you got to do it. You will do it, whether I say it or not. As Paul says in Romans, everybody sins. But you got to face it, taste it, admit it, suffer it. Recognize you're not the great person that you made your race, your religion, your nationality, your country, your gender to be. You know what? You're just like everybody else. Dang it. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> I'm not very good at saying things in a funny way. So it's not your fault. So what we all need is the baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire. Some event, the descent of the Spirit, that tells us what really matters, what's really true, what's really universally true, not just in America, not just in Hispanic culture, gringo culture, what's true everywhere and all the time. And then you're ready to be a universal woman, a universal man. And I hope you all know that's the meaning of Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. 
I'm not sure how many Catholics we're really creating. We tend to be in our small little tribes, much more than loving the universal body of Christ, where we all belong, where we all have our place, where we're all both good and bad. So let's try to let God and love and suffering and grace make us all into Catholics. Do you feel called to walk a more contemplative path? The Center for Action and Contemplation is an educational nonprofit supporting the journey of inner transformation. Grounded in Christian contemplative wisdom and following the thread of perennial wisdom, Our mission is to provide resources to awaken love and nurture the inner self. Learn more about our resources, such as publications, podcasts, email series, and events at www.cac.org.